The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Last week, a mob breached the U.S. Capitol looking to stop Congress from certifying the presidential election results. Yesterday, the House of Representatives impeached Donald Trump for a second time for, in the view of the majority, inciting that mob to riot. It's an American story, but we Canadians watch our neighbors' politics very closely. Are there any signs of such political extremism taking root here? We'll examine that tonight. Also, we'll hear about another instance when we followed our neighbors to the south on a dangerous path. Author Alan Bartley's with us on his new book detailing the history of the Ku Klux Klan in Canada. It's Thursday, January 14th, and that's all next on The Agenda. After the violent confrontation at the U.S. Capitol last week, many people, while shocked, were not exactly surprised. The highly charged politics south of the border, under a president who has not demurred from telling outright falsehoods to fire up his base, were hiding in plain sight. Might there be undercurrents of political extremism that we should be paying attention to before something similar could emerge in Canada? And do progressives try to inappropriately tar Canadian conservatives with the same Trumpist brush. With us to consider all of that, and as is our custom, we'll introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in the nation's capital with John Ibbotson. He's the writer at large for the Globe and Mail. In Perth, Ontario, Randy Hillier, the independent MPP for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. In Oshawa, Ontario, Barbara Perry, professor and director at the Center on Hate, Bias and Extremism at Ontario Tech University. And in East York of the provincial capital, Supriya Devetti, political commentator and former talk radio host. And it's good to have all of you alongside with us tonight in our virtual get-together here on TVO. John, to you first, to what extent do you think that the anger we saw in Washington last week exists here in Canada? Well, it is a truism that everything that happens in the United States eventually happens in Canada and to a lesser degree. So it is probably true that um, the kinds of resentments, the the really unfortunate and regrettable nativist resentments, the resentments of the rural towards the urban, um, the, the cultural resentments that fired Trumpism uh, are here in Canada as well. It's probably also true that thanks to social media, the, the transfer across the border of the tensions between progressives and conservatives um, the, the rendering of that debate from I disagree with you to you are illegitimate in my eyes um, is going to happen here faster uh, than it might have happened in the past. My deep, profound hope, of course, is that this is a much more stable society, a much more consensual society, a society that still retains fundamental levels of trust in its institutions, and that whatever stress we receive, we will be able to endure and overcome but we're going to have some of it. There's no question about that. You see it already on the social media feeds uh, if you spend, as I do, far too much time on Twitter. Well, this is not an academic discussion for one of our guests today because Supriya Devetti uh, left her talk radio position not too long ago uh, because some of the stuff that she was seeing, uh, she felt she wasn't getting very much backup from the managers of the place uh, where she worked. Supriya, I wonder if you could fill us in on, to the extent that you can talk about this, um, Fill us in with some of the details, if you would. Well, I think it really started to manifest itself in the uh, aftermath of the Quebec City mosque shooting, where you we, we all sort of got into this national debate over whether or not the House should pass a non-binding parliamentary motion condemning Islamophobia. And there was a large amount of misinformation and disinformation that was being put on the airwaves, um, not just on you know the talk radio station that I was on, but really across um, the country in terms of tabloid print and talk radio in particular. And I would notice, for example, whenever my show did a fact-based 
piece on the Islamophobia motion um, and some of the other shows, you know, were trafficking in some of that myths and disinformation that I was referring to, I would see a direct correlation in terms of the kinds of things um, that would end up in my inbox and just the sheer volume of it. And for me, it became sort of this constant cycle that whenever there was something in the news cycle that had to do with immigration, that had to do with um, visible minorities, that had to do you know, with race more generally, I would start to see an uptick in hate. And I don't think there was, you know, my contention is I don't think there was enough necessarily done to try and curb some of the myths and, and disinformation um, that was being put on the airwaves. Now, you had a white male co-host, yes? I did. I had two um, co-hosts um, that were both white and male. Did they get the same kind of stuff? I mean, they definitely got it, um, but I don't think they got the same in terms of volume and in terms of content. Um, Matt Gurney, my, my first co-host, um, described it as it would be like, oh, man, you suck, whereas I would get something like, you suck, you bleep-stained C-word, and I'm going to rape you. So very different in terms of the content. You got that? Oh, regular, regularly, yeah. Okay, Barbara, let me bring you into this conversation here. Uh, while the events that were taking place uh, at the doors of the U.S. Capitol were happening, uh, we had our own little Made in Ontario uh, event take place in the streets of Toronto as well. Uh, there was a caravan of, um, well, there were a bunch of pickup trucks driving around downtown Toronto with lots of pro-Trump flags and pro-Trump slogans. And I wonder what you thought about that when you heard about it. Well, I guess I wasn't surprised, and I should say it wasn't only Toronto either. There were uh, similar protests, uh, not the caravan so much as, uh, you know, gatherings of individuals in half a dozen cities across the country. Uh, and we know that there has been support for Trump since, uh, you know, he, he first ran in 2015, in fact, you know, his campaign. Uh, and so, you know, they were Trumps for, Cana for uh, sorry, Canadians for Trump uh, that uh, emerged immediately after uh uh, he began to run and and they're still active and that's certainly what we've seen um, and there is uh, you know sort of sympathy for uh, Trump and his plight uh, as they describe it uh, but also so for some of the other ideologies uh, that support the, uh, the the Patriots as they frame themselves uh, in Washington last week so we do see sort of an anti-authority movement in Canada as well uh, so no surprise it would manifest in the context of uh, those protests the, the American protests now, just to be clear, the Constitution of this country permits peaceable assembly. Uh, to, the, to the best of my recollection, nobody destroyed any property, nobody hurt anybody else. Is there anything illegitimate about these protests? Nothing, certainly nothing uh, illegal about them. Uh, and, you know, these, they were expressing uh, grievances and they were expressing uh, sympathy for, for Trump. Where we see the problems, uh, and this happens more online than, than offline, although we see it on the streets as well, um, is celebration of that violence and promotion of uh, that violence. And we're seeing some of that on the online ch chatter of some of the Canadian uh, far-right groups in particular, not so much the anti-staters. Uh, that is, uh, you know, echoing those calls that we're hearing from the U.S. for violence at uh, Washington Capitol and state capitals as well in the week to come. Now, Randy Hillier, I've left you uh, to the end purposely just so that you could have a chance to hear what everybody else has to say first, and you're the lone elected person uh, in our grouping here uh, this evening as well. Um, and, and I want to make it clear at the outset, we did not invite you on this program because we expect you, quote unquote, to carry the can for all of what happened in the United States. But I am interested in, as an independent MPP, which is what you are, I'm interested in how much of Donald Trump's politics you feel some kind of kinship with. Let's start there. Well, I, I, you know, he's not the great evil Satan. Uh, let's start with that. Um, he's an individual that has his views and has expressed them in a way that is uh, that some people dis dislike, uh, but a great many people obviously do like. And you know, but I think the important thing here, Steve and, and everyone, is that you know, in a in a Western style liberal democracy. Debate and discussion is essential for it to function. Even when that debate and discuss, discussion goes into uh, uncomfortable grounds, and we're seeing a, a very pervasive censorship and suppression of uh, views 
that are not part of the conformist uh, um, agenda. Like it, this is, if if you hold dissenting views, however moderate, however science based and factual, they are still deemed to be vile and offensive, and and worthy of suppression and uh, and censorship. And we've seen this. Stephen Ledrew and I have done a number of videos, and they have been censored. If you don't give people the the avenue to express themselves, to ventilate their concerns, then people, what are people left with but to elevate um, their their disenchantment? And I think we need to take a step back and say, if we want to have a healthy society, we cannot just have one orthodoxy and, and, and subscribe evil, satanic um, elements to somebody that has a, a differing view. I take your point, and I just want to find out where that line is that we can draw between what is maybe uncomfortable or even outrageous free speech versus libelous, slanderous, harmful, awful stuff. Uh, do I take it that you don't approve of the kinds of uh, emails that Supriya Devetti would have received calling her all those foul names? Oh, absolutely. Like, this is... Um, we're, and we're seeing this growth uh, in this outrageous behavior, and, it, and it's unacceptable and it's offensive. Um, and, you know, I would say, it, you know, this is the outgrowth of the, the increasing nihilism that we have in our society, where, where nihilism and this destruction of, of our political, our social, our economic, our religious orders, uh, we've seen this, and it's been really amplified during COVID as well, this where, where reason and rational thought is impotent and, and offensive, outrageous uh, behavior is, is the last refuge of these scoundrels of nihilism. And, and social media is, uh, is a haven for this. Let me follow up with John Ibbotson on this, because, uh, John, I wonder how important you think it is to distinguish between, say, um, you know, as Mitt Romney might have called it, called it severe right-wing conservatism, a distinction between that and the absolute, you know, violent, QAnon, bat-spit, crazy, Trumpist nutjobs, many of whom we saw in Washington last week. Well, it's a pretty clear dividing line, and it exists on both sides of the border. If you say something that incites violence, then you're not allowed to say it. The president of the United States was impeached yesterday in the House of Representatives for the second time because he uttered speech last Wednesday, a week ago, um, that incited the mob to storm the Capitol and to almost um, bring down uh, the congressional arm of the government. Um, that was horrifying, and he has been punished severely for it. You can say anything you want, uh, but it, uh, um, but you can't say it in a way that puts other people at risk. The same for the example applies with the issue of masks. We can debate uh, whether masks are appropriate or inappropriate up until the point that the medical science says you must wear masks or you put other people at risk. When you say, I refuse to wear a mask because I don't care whether other people are at risk and I have my rights, you are putting other people at risk. And at that point, we start to limit your right to, uh, to to put those arguments forward. Or at the very least, we force you to wear the mask. Say what you will, we force you to wear the mask. And there is then one other important point to this. You can say whatever you like, but it is not incumbent on others to give you a platform to say it. We don't care what your opinions are, but the Globe and Mail does not have an obligation to let you express them in the Globe and Mail any more than Twitter or Facebook do. These are private companies, not public institutions, and we need to make that, make that distinction as well. Well, let me follow up with Supriya on that, and I'd be interested in your view on the Supriya in as much as, you know, Stephen LeDrew is a guy who was once president of the federal liberal party of this country. He had a TV show on CP24 for many years. He's now trying his hand at uh, digital content, uh, doing these three-minute interviews with a variety of people on a variety of subjects, and then he uploads them to YouTube. He did do one episode, at least one episode, I think, with Randy Hillier, and apparently YouTube wouldn't put it up. Um, Randy Hillier's uh, legitimately elected by the people of his, di of his uh, constituency, and, you know, he would argue his free speech was impinged upon there. 
Do you think that's okay? I mean, look, I think at the end of the day, YouTube, as John pointed out, is fully within its rights to decide what kind of content they would have put on their platform. And if Mr. LeDrew or Mr. Hillier have an objection to that or take issue with it, nothing is stopping them from creating their own uh, website and just uploading the video to there or putting it on their own social channels. Um, there's a big difference between having the state be the one that is infringing upon what you are saying and what private business is allowed to consider what is appropriate or not for their own medium and for their own audiences. And I think that is a distinction that is often lost and that often gets muddled as we have these, you know, more um, esoteric conversations about free speech because we tend to think of it as free speech, meaning you're allowed to say whatever the heck you want on whatever medium or platform that uh, you wish. And that that's just certainly not the case. And in a lot of ways, it's even more regressive and more chilling if you're compelling and forcing private business um, to do something that is something that they don't want to do, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing that you would see in in, in autocratic countries. It's not the kind of thing that you want to see in, as uh, Mr. Hillier described, you know, Western democratic societies. Well, let me get to Randy Hillier on that. I mean, the charter, uh, Randy, is is supposed to protect you against uh, incursion of on your rights by governments. Uh, YouTube is a private company. They're under no legal obligation to put up material they find in, unacceptable to them. Were your rights really infringed upon by this company as a result? Well, let's look at the, the, the actual facts. It wasn't just a case of, of a video taken down. They've actually removed my YouTube channel for three months for, for rebroadcasting Dr. Roger Hodkinson's uh, address to uh, Edmonton City Council during the debate on whether mass were, um, a mass bylaw was proper and and informed uh, but let's also look at uh, what others are, are happening uh, you know Barry Weiss from the New York Times said this very well last year when um, uh, with the resignation letter um, over how free speech is being impinged upon not just in social media but throughout all media and and yesterday I believe or yesterday or the day before Daniel Smith, another talk radio host, uh, and also a former leader of a prominent um, political party in Alberta, announced her leaving um, talk radio because speech is being infringed upon to the degree where where dissent, any dissent, is objectionable. You know, it's just... Uh, you know, we're we're creating this this con this expectation of conformity to only one orthodoxy, and and everybody around this panel are are knowledgeable and and well read, and they under and everybody in your audience will understand this. If you silence um, uh, moderate scientific facts and 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 suffocate discussion within our society. That brings with it some very dark elements. And and everybody on this panel, many are involved in journalism in the media. You know, the media, I would say, has an obligation to defend freedom of speech uh, in every medium, in every avenue. Of course, uh, you know, and this has been long held and long understood. We know what constitutes defamation and, and libel and slander. And, and the media in the past, over the decades, has done a very good job of, of, of constraining that uh, offensive or def defamatory language. Um, but now uh, I hear crickets from the media when all other dissenting views, I've seen it happen to myself, we've seen it happen to many people, dissenting views um, of any sort are not given an avenue anywhere in, and it's not just social media, it's a great many of our media outlets. Well, I suspect we're going to have some dissenting views on this next piece of information that I bring forward. And Sheldon, to that end, I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osman, uh, bottom of page two, if you could bring up this chart. Thanks. Angus Reid did a poll last November of people who voted in the last federal election in Canada. 
But they were asked about whether or not they thought the American election, the just held presidential election in the States, was fair and therefore should not be contested. And, uh, okay, you see, I, I'm going to go into some detail on this for people who can't see the chart because they're listening on podcast right now. In total, 75% of those surveyed said, yes, the U.S. election was fair and should not be contested. Only 18% of Canadians disagreed with that notion. But let's break it down a little further, and we'll go to the next set of graphs, the next set of bars. Only half of those who voted conservative thought the U.S. election was fair. 41% thought it was not fair. 41%. However, if you look at the more progressive end of the political spectrum in this country, 95% of those who voted Liberal, 92% of those who voted New Democrat, 81% of those who voted for the Bloc Québécois in Quebec strongly or agreed that the U.S. election was fair. That is a significant difference. Barbara Perry, what do you infer from those numbers? Well, I think it it's, uh, follows some of the patterns in the U.S. as well. We see that same split between Democrats and, and Republicans as we see here. Uh, and I think that it is, um, you know, a, a vulnerability uh, to believe the narratives that uh, Trump and, and his followers have been uh, professing. Um, in the absence of any evidence, I remember seeing one of the protesters uh, last week who was questioned by a journalist, what are you trying to do here? And he said, well, we're trying to stop the steal. Um, there's all kinds of evidence that, uh, the, that that election was stolen, uh, and yet we have yet to see any of that evidence. And so I think this is the danger. Um, it's not just uncomfortable speech that we're talking about. It's not just dissent. Uh, it is false disinformation and misinformation and dangerous speech uh, that we're worried about. And, and we saw what the dangers of uh, that kind of ongoing narrative were last week, and we'll see more of that in the coming week. John, I wonder how troubled you are by the notion that half the people who, are, who voted, con only half the people who voted for the Conservative Party in the last federal election thought that the American election was fair and ought not to be contested. Well, I'm disturbed, of course. It is uh, upsetting that extremist right-wing illegitimate lies should have convinced uh, a minority, let us stress, but still a minority of uh, conservative voters uh, that Donald Trump's uh, Donald Trump's lies are somehow true, but it is the nature of the the times in which we live. If you sent out a poll that asked people what they thought about the statement Canada is an illegitimate criminal state founded in violence, um, you would find that a surprisingly large number of people um, on the left wing of the spectrum would accept this. To my mind completely unfair and untrue characterization of what he is, in my mind, the best country in the world. There are extremist elements on both sides, and others who are not so extreme get convinced by their rhetoric uh, at various times on various issues, for example, over whether John A. Macdonald was the founder of this nation or a criminal. What bothers me is that in the debate, there too often those who yell the loudest and those whose positions are least legitimate are the ones who are dominating the discussion, causing uh, the kinds of polls that you see on, you know, on both the left and the right, but making it harder every year, it seems, for moderate conservatives, moderate uh, progressives to hold the center. Supriya, how concerned are you that these numbers give the, they certainly give the very strong impression that, that um, well, that conservatives feel the fix is in against them? Yeah, that's obviously a huge issue, um, and I think it's only exacerbated by the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic, and you need folks to have trust in their institutions. You need people to have trust in um, the public institutions around them so that they don't become disaffected and you don't see the kind of violence that uh, we currently witnessed last week in the U.S. or in many other uh, parts of the world. I think, though, the more troubling aspect here is that we are basically at a point where we can't even seem to establish what what is and what is not true. Uh, the election was not stolen from Donald Trump. That that is, you know, by all by all sense, by every sense of in terms of the evidence that's available and the facts that are on the ground, he lost legitimately that election. That you have a sizable minority of folks here in Canada that refuse to believe that. I think speaks to some of the more uh, troubling aspects of the Conservative Party and their base and the media 
media ecosystem that tends to prop up those voices. And just to give one example, I mean, during the um, Yellow Vest movement, when you had a, again, a, a minority, but a sizable minority of folks that were showing up to these protests with hang Trudeau signs or Trudeau for treason signs, you didn't necessarily hear or see um, right-leaning politicians vociferously condemn it. Um, the you know reaction from a lot of the right was to just pretend it wasn't happening and to pass off any criticism or any pointing out of some of the more insidious elements as just deflecting from the issue. We need to expose the sorts of things that we're seeing, and we need to recognize this. And I think um, a part of the issue that is being compounded here is that a lot of the folks that do the reporting on political issues, whether it's on the commentary side or on the straight-up reporting side, have a very poor understanding of online spaces and online radicalization. And I think another really good example of that was in the immediate aftermath of the Toronto van attack, where you had a bunch of journalists that were rather established come out and profess them, you know, they're not knowing about the existence of incels whatsoever, let alone that they could have a propensity towards violence. If you ask some of the younger journalists, some of the, some of the female journalists about incels, I mean, they would tell you quite readily that they knew about their existence and they knew about the online radicalization aspect of incels since Gamergate back in 2014. And, and I think our political establishment and our, you know, media establishment does a very poor job of translating that information to the public. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Randy, I do need to get your interpretation of those numbers, and I'll set up the question with this. You know, Donald Trump and his lawyers went to court more than 60 times, uh, barely ever introducing actual empirically provable evidence that the election was stolen, got thrown out of court. I think, I think they were, they, they, I think they won once and lost 60 times. Um, and, and some of the uh, appearances they made in court were just downright embarrassing. I mean, Rudy Giuliani made a fool of himself over and over and over and over again. Uh, th this was a this was sworn by so many election observers, including Republicans, to be a basically clean election, the results of which we should respect. And yet half the conservative party voters in this country, only half, thought it was a free and fair election. What are we to infer from that? Well, I, I think one of the things, you know, uh, Professor uh, Jonathan Haidt uh, explored this divide uh, very well in his book, uh, The Righteous Mind, and, and looking at the differences between the uh, the, um, the psychological characteristics of, of conservatives and and liberals, and but also looking at uh, the elements of why we're getting to where we are in this society, and um, you know it, it, that doesn't surprise it doesn't surprise anybody because. These days in the Western world, in Canada, the United States, and others, um, we intuitively and in default uh, dismiss any suggestion from the other side, it, uh, no matter how valid, no matter how extreme, no matter m however moderate, uh, we intuitively and in default just reject it. Um, and, and we use language um, that is a, a language of rejection as well. Like, you know, uh, I heard the term misinformation uh, used on uh, in this discussion. And because somebody has a different opinion, that doesn't mean it's misinformation. Does you know, the opinion have, not have to be have, based in fact, though, Randy? Well, we, we have facts and we have evidence and we have data. And we can draw different conclusions from that. Uh, uh, you know, and and we can draw different opinions from that. That does not mean it's misinformation. Uh, you know, and and we should be embracing those various opinions and different perspectives that come into the to the marketplace of discussion. And indeed, uh, you know, our parliament, uh, the the root word uh, parliament is derived from the French word parler, to speak. And to speak, it also requires someone to listen. And, and in Parliament, it you know, engraved in the walls, it says to hear the other side. Okay, and 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 I and I put this far more down to this this uh, this terrible growth in nihilism in our uh, in our countries, where where people are losing meaning and purpose in their lives, and and going into this very um, uh, 
extreme conformist mindset where where you know you can only be individual if you conform like it's and and if you don't conform uh, that gives us license to be offensive and vile to you uh, uh, and whatever that conformity is whether it's on the right or the left there uh, there this is this is a terrible situation that we're setting our our government our society our peaceful good ordered uh, society into a um, a very extreme um, outcomes and, and dangerous outcomes and, and we need to go back to our principles of, of freedom of speech of freedom of assembly and and to listen to the other side if we're to come out of this uh, with anything that resembles uh, a good and prosperous and successful society. Okay, let me try this with Barbara. Barbara, I'm going to read something that Jonathan Kay wrote in the National Post a week ago. Sorry, John, uh, rival newspaper, but uh, humor me for a second here. And, uh, and then, Barbara, I'd like you to comment on it. Uh, Jonathan wrote, it's now been more than five and a half years since Trump announced his presidential campaign. His politics are toxic, but they are no longer ascendant or even novel. And Wednesday's fiasco will only discredit them further. If right-wing populism really were going to metastasize northward in a meaningful way, it would have happened by now, but it hasn't. Jonathan Kay seems quite comforted by that. Barbara, I wonder whether you think he should be. Well, I, I don't think it is the case that it hasn't migrated northward. I think we have seen a dramatic increase in far-right populism and far-right activity in the, the Canadian context. Uh, we estimate uh, in 2015, our first report on right-wing extremism, we estimated just over 100 active uh, far-right groups in Canada, and now we're, we're looking at closer to 300 uh, active groups and many more individuals that don't necessarily affiliate with particular groups, but engage very much uh, with their social media platforms. So uh, those sentiments are here. We've seen evidence of that in, uh, in, in terms of the violence we've seen in the past few years, uh, Manassian being one, um, Bizanet being another, uh, Justine Bork, uh, I, could, I could go on. I mean, we've had over 20 homicides associated with far-right narratives in the past uh, six or eight years or so. Uh, and then you add that, I think, again, to the, uh, the online activity, um, to the fact that, uh, you know, uh, Rideau Cottage, the grounds of Rideau Cottage were uh, invaded by a, a, a military person, sorry, military personnel uh, with four guns, including two uh, assault rifles. Um, it has come here and we need to confront it. Uh, we don't need to dismiss it. I don't want to dismiss it. I want to confront it. I want to challenge it. I want to have those conversations and, and deconstruct some of the ideologies that uh, enable that kind of violence. Having said that, John, you had a piece in the Globe and Mail the other day in which you basically warned everybody, uh, here it comes. The liberals are going to be painting all conservatives with the same Trumpist brush. Get ready for it, uh, particularly as we get closer to an election. What's your concern there? Again, the inability to have civil dialogue. Um, it is, un you know, we, we, we need to worry far more about uh, extremist right-wing violence. In fact, we don't need to worry about extremist left-wing violence because it virtually doesn't exist. The, exi the, the, the violence comes from the right. It needs to be documented. It needs to be condemned. It needs to be as far as the police can prevent it. So let's not uh, let's let's not try to make this a what aboutism. It's not that this is an issue of the right, not of the left, in terms of violence. But if you characterize anyone on the right as illegitimate. If you, can, if you characterize all conservatives as illegitimate, as being part and part, so, oh, maybe not as bad as the, the really right-wing nut jobs, but, you know, they're in the same camp. Every one of them, they're all in the same camp, as some progressives are doing. The liberals are doing it because, hey, that's politics, right? But also other progressive groups are doing it as well. I wrote a column that said Mike Harris deserved the Order of Ontario. I was pilloried for it. I have written columns and books saying that there are, uh, there are positive elements to Stephen Harper's 10 years in, uh, in, as prime minister. And in fact, it was more positive than negative. And you get on the other side of the argument, no, you cannot give Mike Harris the Order of Ontario. You cannot defend Stephen Harper as anything other than a dictatorial, autocratic, malevolent leader because conservatism is illegitimate. Conservatism does not deserve to have to, to have influence or power in this country. You only stoke and feed the fires of the trolls and the intolerance on all sides of the argument when you act like that. 
Yes, condemn violence in every aspect, on every form, but do not stifle debate and do not believe that one of the two governing parties and of this country and the millions of people who support them are in bed with the extremists. It just makes it impossible, or at least far more difficult, for the rest of us to hold the thing together. I warned you all when we started this thing that the time would fly by, and it really has. That's our time. I'm really grateful to all four of you for coming on to TVO tonight and having this conversation, which I think was a full, free, and uh, openly aired debate, which we're very glad about. Uh, John Ibbotson, Randy Hillier, Barbara Perry, Sapria DeVetti, be well, everybody, and thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Steve. You, Steve. Many Canadians associate the Ku Klux Klan with the tragic days of segregation in the United States. But for more than a century, the Klan had a presence here in Canada, too. As Alan Bartley's new book chronicles, it's called The Ku Klux Klan in Canada, A Century of Promoting Racism and Hate in the Peaceable Kingdom. Alan Bartley is an adjunct professor in the Department of Political Science at Carleton University and a former intelligence analyst. And he joins us now from the nation's capital. It's good to meet you, Professor Bartley. How are you doing? Very good. Thanks very much. Not at all. Let's do an excerpt from the book, and then we'll dive in. Hate, you write, has a name. Hate has a face. Hate has an address. It lives in Canada. The Ku Klux Klan's more than 100-year presence in Canada demonstrates how hate lived and flourished in the nation, sometimes known as the Peaceable Kingdom. Our neighbors were partly to blame, but Canadians can also blame themselves. That is going to come as news to a lot of people. Uh, before I picked up the book, myself included, I never knew that uh, people with white sheets and so on ran around the streets of Toronto and beyond. Why did you want to tell this story? Uh, the story came to me rather than me going to seek the story. Um, I had done some research on the Klan back in the late 1990s uh, while I was in graduate school. And I did an academic article at the time on the Klan in Ontario, and I basically put that work aside and uh, left it. And then we have the election of Donald Trump in the United States. We have the march in Charlottesville in Virginia in uh, 2017. And I was asked if I was interested in going back and looking at the Klan uh, again for uh, purposes of a book. And initially, I have to say, I was reluctant. Uh, this is not a topic on which I'd uh, chosen to spend any time academically speaking or intellectually speaking. But as I looked at what was going on in the United States and I recalled the impact that the Klan had in Ontario, uh, I realized that uh, if there was going to be a time to examine the history of the Klan in Canada, this was probably it. So I undertook to, uh, to further my research and produce the book that you've seen and referred to. Yes, indeed. Now, how and when did the Klan first arrive in Canada? The Klan arrived cinematographically, if I can put it that way, in the that's that uh, a movie called The Birth of a Nation, which is uh, quite famous historically, uh, arrived in Canada in the fall of um, 1915. The Birth of a Nation was essentially a glorification of the Ku Klux Klan and the spirit uh, of a defeated confederacy. It essentially told the story, which is based on fact, uh, of the creation of the Ku Klux Klan as a vigilante organization established by uh, uh, former Confederate soldiers, white soldiers, uh, to impose some sort of order, uh, as they saw it, on freed blacks in the southern United States. Uh, the Klan itself, uh, at the time, was uh, eventually outlawed by the United States government and went underground for the rest of the uh, 19th century. But with the arrival of The Birth of a Nation and the movie and the story it told, uh, the Klan breathed a, a new life in, in, uh, in the 20th century. And the film, when it arrived in Toronto and when it arrived in all the other major cities across the country, uh, played, played to very, very uh, large crowds. Uh, lineups around the block uh, to buy tickets in Toronto and elsewhere. And it was uh, a feature of, of the theater world uh, from coast to coast uh, for four or five years and beyond, well into the 1920s. Uh, the birth of a nation played over and over and over again. Now, the message of that motion picture certainly does not hold up all these years later, but the picture was considered landmark for its time. It obviously was the silent movie coming in before talkies. 
But just to be clear here, when the Klan eventually did have its presence in Canada, um, you know, we think of the Ku Klux Klan as a bunch of guys with capes and, and uh, you know, white sheets on their heads and burning crosses. Is that the kind of Klan that came to Canada? Absolutely. Uh, the Klan arrived uh, in bits and pieces in the early 1920s. First uh, recruiters arrived piecemeal in 1920, 1921. Uh, the, the ground had already been prepared, if you will, by the images of birth of a nation. And so when recruiters started arriving in the lower mainland of British Columbia, in the Maritimes, in southern Ontario, there was a real appetite uh, to see what this was about. Some people in uh, southern Ontario arrived at recruiting meetings with their own homemade hoods, uh, which sort of indicates that there was a, uh, a desire to, to join up right away. So, yes, the image that the Klan has always had of white hoods, of cloaks, of regalia, absolutely. Yeah, all of it backlit with burning crosses. And did they have much of a presence in, for example, in the province of Ontario? We often think of the Klan in uh, Canada as being primarily focused in the West and in Saskatchewan in particular. But in fact, the Klan in Ontario was an extremely large organization uh, during the mid-1920s. Uh, there were rallies in cities and towns across the province uh, where you would have 5, 10, 15, 20,000 participants. Uh, this is not something I think that's readily recognized. But if you go back and look at the newspaper accounts of the day, the Klan was a very, very large and popular organization and it had a lot of adherents in the province of Ontario. Now, you say a, a large organization, but would they, and, and public, would they have had, for example, a secret presence inside, um, you know, city councils or the cabinet table or, you know, federal politics, that kind of thing? Uh, maybe not outwardly, but secretly. There's some evidence that the Klan had members in municipal councils uh, in places across the province. I'm thinking particularly the city of Guelph, where it was rumored that at least two or three of the councillors uh, were secret Klan members. It was also rumored that some members of the Guelph Police Service uh, were uh, members of the Klan. Uh, in terms of overt members, no. Uh, that does not seem to have been a feature of political life in Ontario. And generally speaking, with one exception, or two exceptions rather, in other parts of the country. Uh, the Klan tended in the early days in Ontario to take on the trappings of the American Klan with cross burnings, with intimidation of black people, with intimidation of Catholics, uh, with intimidation of Jewish people, but it didn't have a, a directed political uh, momentum. Now, that's not the case in Saskatchewan, uh, to a lesser extent in New Brunswick, and to a certain extent in Alberta. Uh, there, the Klan had definite political goals, mostly driven by the leadership and for reasons which had to do with unique circumstances in those jurisdictions. Now, of course, one of the most appalling things that the Klan did in the Deep South was the lynching of blacks. Did that kind of thing happen here? I have found no evidence of lynchings. There were certainly beatings. There was at least two kidnappings. There was one tarring and feathering. Uh, but the violence associated, and arson, uh, and one bombing. But the uh, violence that's associated with the Ku Klux Klan in the United States, by and large, did not come to pass in Canada. But there was certainly enough violence associated with the Klan uh, in reality and in terms of the uh, animosities, the public animosities that they created, that they lived up to their uh, reputation. And again, in the United States, law enforcement certainly turned a blind eye to much of what they did. Uh, many law enforcement officers, of course, secretly support and not so secretly supported uh, the actions of the Klan. How about up here? A different context. Um, in Ontario and in Saskatchewan, the Ontario Provincial Police and the Saskatchewan Provincial Police uh, mounted investigations against the Klan. Uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, uh, allegations of fraud and theft of membership uh, monies. Uh, the second had to do with the potential threat of violence. So in those jurisdictions, uh, the provincial police forces uh, recruited 
um, human sources in the organization and had them report back to the police uh, in those provinces. Uh, nationally, the RCMP noted the presence of the Klan, but in New Brunswick, for example, and in Saskatchewan, uh, virtually no sense that the RCMP were concerned or overly concerned about the presence or the activities of the Klan. Now, we know they certainly wanted to make life miserable for blacks here, for Jews, for Catholics, but what was their ultimate end goal? We have to remember that in the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan in Canada was primarily a commercial enterprise. Uh, the selling of membership, the selling and rental of robes and regalia, uh, that was where the money was. And uh, if the Klan was nothing else, it was a commercial enterprise. So from that point of view, the goal was fairly sh limited and short term. It capitalized on some inherent antipathies and hatreds that existed in Canada. Uh, and from there, we start to see the move into political arenas and the expression of um, political objectives having mostly to do with uh, keeping um, Catholics out of political power, keeping French speakers from taking over or having a presence in the schools in particular. Uh, and. Um, essentially maintaining the status quo uh, as it was seen in, in Ontario and other places in the country. So the political goals initially were quite limited. That's different than what happened in Saskatchewan, where as time went on in the late 1920s, uh, the Ku Klux Klan contributed significantly to the defeat of the Liberal government of Jimmy Gardner uh, and putting in place a Conservative um, government that essentially gave the Klan everything that it was seeking in terms of um, anti-Catholic, anti-French, anti-Quebec uh, um, objectives. So the political ambitions of the Klan uh, in the West were much more clearly defined, not so much in the rest of the country. There were stories uh, after the 1925 provincial election in New Brunswick, for example, uh, that the Klan had been a significant contributor to the defeat of the Liberal government there. There's evidence that the Klan was certainly active on behalf of the Conservative Party, but I don't think it can be argued that the Klan was uh, a decisive factor in that election, uh, not as they were four or five years later in the Saskatchewan provincial election of 1929. Okay, so you've got the Klan basically making its presence known in Canada about 100 years ago, having relatively more or less political influence in depending on what province they were in. When did the uh, Ku Klux Klan start to decline in Canada? The Klan was uh, surprisingly active up until 1930 or so. Um, with the advent of the Depression in 1929, uh, there simply wasn't any money uh, available for most people to join an organization like the Klan which had fairly hefty uh, membership dues for the time. And so the Klan went into decline into the early 1930s, replaced, if you will, by uh, fascist groups that were aligned with the, uh, the Nazi party in Germany. By the time you get into the 1950s, 1960s, uh, there's essentially no organized Klan in Ontario at all. There uh, are sporadic uh, outbreaks of brawls on walls and uh, potentially uh, threats against black people, but not the kind of organization that we'd seen during the 1920s, early 1930s. But a reemergence in the 1970s? A reemergence in the 1970s. And I've, I've looked at this quite closely, as have others. And it's a congruence, I think, of a number of things. Um, the 1920s Ku Klux Klan was, as I say, largely a commercially driven organi organization. By the 1970s, early 1980s, ideology seems to have overtaken that motive amongst the Canadian organizers. There was a healthy dose of ego involved in the case of Canadian leaders. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan in the United States during the early 1980s was enjoying a revival, along with a number of other organizations on the extreme right wing largely driven by ideology and um, 
religious motives that fall under the umbrella of Christian identity. Uh, and so you see a resurgence of these groups in the United States. You get echoes of that in Canada, and you see a short-lived resurgence of the Klan in 1980, 1981, 1982, 1983. Uh, by that point, most of the leaders in Canada were in jail for various criminal activities uh, of one kind or another, including conspiracy to murder. Let me pick up on that, because there there is a crazy story, and I remember this very well, because actually a guy I knew in Hamilton participated in this, believe it or not, when a bunch of Canadians went down to the Caribbean and they tried to essentially launch a coup on the island of Dominica. Um, I guess this would have been the late 1970s, and it, it spectacularly failed, but it was, I mean, it was a harebrained, crazy idea that some people thought they could pull off. What role did the Klan have in all of that? Yes, that is a harebrained scheme, which um, in retrospect looks like it was a fantasy. At the time, though, and in the political context of the late 1970s, early 1980s, there were some people that felt it had some chance of success. The um, original idea originated uh, with an American in Texas. Um, he peddled it to the Ku Klux Klan in the United States. Uh, the Klan in the United States peddled it to the two Canadians uh, who were leading up the Klan in Canada, one of whom, Wolfgang Drogi, uh, actually um, uh, was arrested along with uh, a number of other people in Louisiana in the, in the uh, early 1980s um, and spent time in jail as a result uh, of, of, this, uh, of this particular plan. There was some sense that it might have succeeded. The ideological orientation here was, we will take over this small island nation in the Caribbean. We will turn it into a criminal nation, if you will, a criminal state. We will make money by selling false passport or genuine passports um, to people who probably shouldn't have them. We will set up casinos. We will develop the island as a tourist attraction. We will make a lot of money and we will turn the profits from these activities into the pursuit of white supremacist goals across North America and the world. Wolfgang Droge, who you just mentioned there, actually made a bit of a comeback in, a, in another group. Um, I think it was the Western Guard or the National Front or something like Heritage. that. Heritage Front, thank you, that was it. And so I, I, I guess I want to know what kind of influence the Klan ultimately played um, on, what kind of influence did the Klan have on other hate groups that uh, would emerge in the, in the 1980s and beyond? I think we can argue successfully that the Ku Klux Klan in the early 1980s was the incubator for some leadership figures like Wolfgang Drogi and others who became involved in other organizations over the following decades, the Heritage Front being the most uh, prominent and probably from a certain perspective the most successful, but even the Heritage Front uh, came to nothing primarily because of investigations by the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, which led to this disintegration of the Heritage Front. The um, leadership figures in the Heritage Front and other organizations um, got their start in the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and so from that point of view, the Klan has had an enduring legacy in this country that I think we need to acknowledge. Uh, and uh, that's why I think it's important that we recognize that the Klan has, a, has and had a significance far out of proportion to its numbers and its influence. And what kind of presence does it have in Canada today? Over the last 20 years, individuals and small groups of people across the country have presented themselves as being the Ku Klux Klan in Canada. That may have been true or not. It's uh, really a question of uh, what their affiliations were with the Ku Klux Klan in the United States, where it continues to be a viable organization. Um, but the Ku Klux Klan in Canada as far as I can determine at this time, is individuals and small groups who may or may not think they belong to the Klan and carry on some of the hateful, and I use the word deliberately, hateful ideologies uh, that the Klan has peddled for more than 100 years. Well, be that as it may, and let's finish up on this, um, I think one of the things that emerges from your book is the notion that hateful, violent, 
white supremacist groups, whether you want to call them the Ku Klux Klan or in more recent times by different names, well, look, they seem to have an ability to reconstitute themselves and, and stay present uh, even in very multicultural Canada today. What do you think that says? Sadly, I think it says that we have a legacy of hatred and, and uh, bias in this country that we need to be aware of and need to continue to struggle against. Uh, whether we can overcome it in the long term remains to be seen. But the right wing, the extreme right wing, the Klan and similar organizations have got a true and proven ability to take advantage of technology, to tell their story, to willing ears and willing listeners. And we need to be aware of that and deal with it as we find it. As I say, hate has a place, hate had an address. And sadly, I think hate is present in this country in ways that we probably wish it wasn't, but it is. That's Carleton University professor Alan Bartley, whose book, The Ku Klux Klan in Canada, A Century of Promoting Racism and Hate in the Peaceable Kingdom, uh, is, a, is a real revelation, I think, to many of us who had no idea that the Klan had this kind of presence in our country. Uh, thanks so much for coming on to TVO tonight and telling us about it, Alan. Appreciate it. And that is the agenda for Thursday, January 14th, 2021. With Ontario now under stay-at-home orders, tomorrow we're assessing what the lockdowns can and can't accomplish. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. And Nam Kiwanuka, we'll see you here tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.